At a mind-boggling 120 meters in height, Starship is easily the largest and most powerful rocket on the planet. With all 33 engines ignited, this beast will produce a minimum of 3,053 metric tons of thrust. Until recently, we weren't sure whether or not the clamps on the orbital launch mount would be able to actually hold the vehicle down during a 33-engine static fire attempt. On November 14th of last year, SpaceX proved that this would be no problem at all when they performed a 14-engine long-duration static fire test. Booster 7 performed this test with less than 10% of the liquid oxygen it's capable of holding. Without doing any math, we can say with relative certainty that if SpaceX fills the liquid oxygen tanks so they're about halfway full and then performs a 33-engine static fire test, there will actually be less upwards force on those clamps than there was during the 14-engine static fire test. But on the flip side of that coin, when fully fueled, the combined Starship and Super Heavy booster weigh more than 5,000 tons. That's a lot of weight for the orbital launch mount to support. How does SpaceX know that the 20 hold-down arms will even be able to support this kind of weight? Well, the truth is, in a way, they don't. The good news is, it appears that this week they plan to find out, and the method they have chosen to test these capabilities is not one you might expect. My name is Zach Golden, and welcome to this CSI Starbase Special Report. Right off the bat, I know a lot of you may be thinking, how is it possible that SpaceX doesn't know whether or not the orbital launch mount can support the weight of a fully loaded booster in Starship? Well, the problem is that as of the time of this episode, this is the most we have ever seen SpaceX fill the booster in Starship while they are stacked on the orbital launch mount. The total mass of the full stack at this moment is actually less than what the booster weighs when both tanks are completely full. So in reality, this cryo test of Booster 7 was the most weight that the orbital launch mount has ever had to bear thus far. Theoretically, SpaceX should be able to assume with a reasonable level of confidence that the structure will in fact hold up as designed. The Starship orbital launch mount was designed using 3D modeling software, which more than likely gives them the ability to simulate the mass of a full stack and then perform a static structural analysis on the 20 load arms. While everything may look good on paper, it's probably not a good idea to test this out for the first time with a fully loaded booster and Starship on the pad. Even if they take the safe route and use liquid nitrogen inside of the methane tanks, if any of the 20 load arms on the launch mount were to buckle or collapse, causing the vehicle to tip over, the results would be catastrophic. Depending on the direction it falls, it would likely damage both the tower and the launch mount, or in the worst case, it would completely annihilate the orbital tank farm. So how will SpaceX make sure that these 20 load arms are up to the task? Well, thanks to Starship Gazer, we were able to figure this out. Let's look at the evidence trail that helped us solve this mystery. This is Grover. He's a Grove GMK 7450 all-terrain boom lift crane. It's easily the busiest mobile crane in all of Starbase and is likely one of the longest serving cranes as well. Grover is a very unique crane that has the ability to transform into several different configurations depending on the job at hand. Grover has a pair of stabilizer arms mounted on either side of his extendable boom. When they aren't in use, you can consider whatever he's doing as light work. On the other hand, this configuration is used for heavier loads that require the use of his gigantic counterweight tray. When even more lateral stability and lift capacity is needed, the arms can fold out to either side like a pair of wings, which is probably why it's referred to as the Mega Wing Lift System. If you ever visit Starbase and see Grover in this configuration, just know that he means business, and it's probably something important. So, on December 30th, we noticed Grover getting set up behind the orbital tank farm next to the launch mount. We asked Starship Gazer to try and get a good angle of him to see what he was lifting. The moment he arrived at the launch complex, a blanket of fog began to appear out of nowhere, severely limiting visibility. He moved into the sand dunes to get a closer look, when SpaceX responded by ramping up the power on their artificial fog generation machine located on the liquid oxygen side of the orbital tank farm. Through a lucky break in the haze, he was able to get a glimpse of some sort of lifting device being prepared on the ground in front of Grover. He wasn't able to make out much detail though before SpaceX completely smoked him out with the harmless inert gases. On the 2nd of January, Gazer went back out to Starbase and got us some updated images of the odd looking load spreader being assembled on the launch pad. Examining it closely, we can immediately see one important feature of this lifting jig that tells us exactly what its purpose is. It's pretty clear that this is a one-to-one -one match with the clamping surfaces on the Super Heavy booster located between each of the 20 Raptor boost engines. 
Thanks to these amazing renders by Ryan Hanson Space, we can better visualize how this system works. Once this end is placed around one of the load arms, the hold down clamp will shut and secure it into place. After this, a hydraulic piston located on one end of the crossbar will extend until the opposite end is the perfect length to reach the clamp located on the other side of the table. This essentially allows the jig to be fitted into place easily without the need to manufacture a custom length load spreader for this job. The upper portion being held by the crane in this image is not part of the assembly. It's just a load spreader used to lift the Starship mass simulator into place. Below the two clamp adapters, which look like gigantic bottle openers, you can see two more pistons in the vertical position attached to a third load spreader bar, which is even larger than the first two. This one has a Versa bar logo on it, which is the company SpaceX contracted for this job, which specializes in manufacturing custom heavy lift rigging systems. Speaking of heavy lifts, on Tuesday morning, Epic Space Flight's 24-7 livestream cam captured this load of counterweights being transported to the launch site. There were 24 counterweights on the self-propelled modular transports. Each of these weighed 10 tons. The next time we saw these SPMTs, they were underneath the launch mount with an additional 240 tons of counterweights added on top. This gives us a total of 480 tons. Notice that all of these counterweights are sitting on top of some sort of frame that could allow for all of them to be lifted at the same time. This is basically the same thing as a suspended counterweight tray that you might see on a large crawler crane. Returning to the mass simulator jig, we can see that on the end of the piston, there is a blue shaft with a silver collar in the center of it. There are two cables plugged into the one on the left side, which is an indication that this is actually a load cell. These load cells will allow SpaceX to monitor the total mass being lifted by each of these two pistons as they slowly retract. This suggests that we may not actually see this counterweight tray ever leave the ground. Doing a little math, we know that there are 480 tons of counterweights on this tray. The frame of the counterweight tray and the lifting rig is probably at least another 20 tons, if not more. So let's just call it 500 metric tons. Because this is suspended between two clamps, each one could experience a maximum simulated weight of 250 metric tons. As I said before, the booster in Starship weighed just over 5,000 US tons when fully fueled. This converts to 4,536 metric tons. If we divide by 20, that gives us 227 metric tons per arm. This means that SpaceX should be able to test these hold down arms up to 110% of their maximum expected load. For all you engineers out there, this translates to a safety factor of 1.1. For this reason, I don't think it would be necessary to actually lift the full counterweight tray off of the ground. SpaceX will likely retract the pistons until the load cell is reading roughly 238 tons or 105% of the expected load and then release it. This is just enough force to give a reasonable margin of safety without pushing the arms too close to their limits. In my opinion, if the counterweight tray is lifted off of the ground, then the only way this load sensor would be useful is if it was reporting back the magnitude of force exerted on the arms before it failed or experienced permanent deformation. SpaceX rarely performs tests to failure, so I don't think that's the goal here. This test is one among many qualification tests that SpaceX is choosing to perform on the vehicle and launch system before the first orbital flight attempt. I expect that this will take several days because SpaceX will likely perform this stress test on all 20 clamps, which means they will have to repeat this process 10 separate times. In order to speed up this process, there is one more important component that will be added to this custom load spreader. This yellow cylinder is known as a thrust bearing jaw and eye swivel. This will allow the Starship mass simulator to be rotated from position to position without ever needing to readjust the counterweight tray below. It is possible that SpaceX could just test one or two pairs of clamps and then use those results to verify all 20 but I'm hoping that they treat these the same way that they treat the 39 Raptor engines on the Starship and Booster and thoroughly verify every single one of them. Hopefully there is nothing exciting to report by the time it's over. If one of these hold down arms were to fail, that would be a pretty major setback for the 33 engine static fire, full stack wet dress rehearsal, and orbital flight test that we are all expecting to see over the coming weeks and months. It's important to note that the reason this is happening now instead of like, I don't know, a year ago, is because it's highly probable that this is one of the many line items on the list of requirements that the FAA has asked SpaceX to complete before issuing them a launch license. It's great to see these steps getting completed one by one, and hopefully there aren't too many left to check off. Before we go, I want to say thanks to 3D forensics agent Ryan Hanson Space for putting together the animations for today's special report. Make sure you follow him on Twitter for more great content. I'm pretty sure he's got something major he's planning to release soon, but I don't want to spoil that surprise. 
I want to also give a huge shout out to Starship Gazer for traveling out to the launch site multiple times over the last few days to get these images. It's about a two hour round trip for Gazer, and as you can imagine, that definitely takes a toll on his vehicle over time, especially when the entire highway leading up to Starbase looks like this. If you would like to help Starship Gazer make future trips to Starbase so we can continue to bring you these CSI special reports, then please consider becoming a monthly supporter on Patreon via the link in the description. I hope you enjoyed our first episode of the new year. If so, then please hit that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. We have about five or six deep dive investigations in the work right now, and in the next few weeks we will be releasing an in-depth analysis of the challenges SpaceX has faced while trying to verify structural integrity on Ship 24 and Booster 7 ahead of the first orbital flight test. This is going to be a major deep dive that spans over the entire history of the Starship program, so make sure you set your alerts. Hopefully I'll see you all there. Until then, Stage Zero Zach, signing out. <laughs>